The membership of CAPLA is composed both of individuals and of organizations and associations. And there is an elected board of directors from across Canada who helps to formulate the activities and the direction and the policies of CAPLA. So in Canada, knowing that we have a very large country and we have 13 provinces and jurisdictions, so internally within Canada, it's very advantageous for us to be able to get together like we are at this conference and discuss things between jurisdictions because education in Canada is a provincial policy and jurisdiction. So we exchange ideas, exchange resources, and try and come to some common understanding across the country. The more the globe is changing and the world, I think, is shrinking, people are moving various places, um, not always permanently, and sometimes move around from country to country. There is more um, interest and demand on people in our field to make that mobility as efficient and possible as can be. That's where the recognition of prior learning and the credentials of global qualifications come in. So working towards that in making the ability to be able to recognize and have people make use of, full use of the skills and abilities they have. So I plan as an international network, and you'll notice the number of acronyms because in different countries, PLAR, PLA, RPL, etc., is called different things. It could be accreditation of prior expensial experiential learning, recognition of prior learning, RCC is a new one. Anybody know what that one is? Okay, recognition of current competencies, which more and more is coming into place in terms of the regulated professions, etc. And there are many more acronyms. So regardless of what it's called in the various countries, we're a network of trying to encourage people to exchange resources to be able to do that. One of the things actually the Scottish network is starting to do is to define what they mean by RPL. So, so basically in the blue here, I plan as a desire to share ideas, experience, and resources. The goals of I plan has been set to build a strong network of individuals and organization so that PLAR and learning is viewed as a key component of adult learning and a key resource. Openly share resources and talk about coming to some common understanding and terminology because of the difficulties if terminology is not the same. The same. And a sharing of principles of good practice and of examples. So basically, in bottom line, what we're looking at here is the exchange of resources, research, and best practices, how they could be shared and discussed on an ongoing basis. And so what we're going to do today is to have a couple of things on this panel. We're going to have Margaret Cameron speak about there have been some the development of European Union guidelines on informal and non-formal learning. And Scotland, Margaret will explain to you, which has a full um, qualification framework, national qualification framework, and very much in RPL as part of that, will explain in terms of the way they've looked at the connections between what they do in Scotland and the European Union. And then Christine will talk about the new research network in Canada for RPL and then we'll come back and discuss what we might focus on with IPLAN and some of the activities that we might move forward on from there. If we could hold questions until people have finished speaking, if, if a question comes to you while they're speaking, mark it down, please, and we'll also be taking questions from the people who are online. So next then, if we could ask Margaret. Well, good. Good morning. Um, my name is Margaret Cameron. I'm one of the managers at the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework Partnership. The partnership is the body that has been set up to manage the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, which is Scotland's lifelong learning framework. Uniquely, 
It is a company limited by guarantee in terms of frameworks, and its partners are the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education in Scotland, the University of Scotland, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, the Scottish Government and Scottish Colleges, which is the representative body of our, our Scottish uh, colleges. Hasn't this just been a wonderful conference so far in terms of the amount of information that is there that we have to go back and reflect on? I was here yesterday and found the, that I have so many cards and things that I must follow up that I've just found absolutely wonderful and the hospitality has been excellent. And I'd like to thank you for that. Gail contacted me uh, earlier this year and she asked me if I would talk, uh, provide a little brief overview of the principles of the European guidelines for the validation of non-formal and informal learning. And she asked if I would then summarise the Scottish guidelines for the recognition of prior learning and then to try and pick out the similarities between the two of them. In developing the EU guidelines, the development, they put together an inventory of what was happening across Europe, and they have an inventory of around 32 countries, which they, in the documentation, say that they will update twice a year. So that will be an interesting development in the EU. The EU guidelines are linked to the European Qualifications Framework. The European Qualifications Framework is the tool for, to be able to translate the qualifications and the learning from across Europe. In developing the guidelines, the, the group, the EU, set up peer learning clusters in order to share practice and to channel collective efforts in constructing the, the guidelines. The drafts of these guidelines were widely circulated prior to the, um, being published in earlier this year. I think it was April of this year. You might ask why, and why draw up guidelines for, for Europe on the validation of prior learning. Their purpose is purely to improve lifelong learning throughout Europe and to strengthen the comparability and the transparency of the validation approaches and hopefully the transferability of credit. The EU guidelines should be seen as an evaluative tool for those who are involved in validation of prior learning, whether that's local, regional or in, indeed national levels. Underpinning the validation of non-formal and informal learning is that the validation, of course, must be voluntary and the privacy of individuals must be respected. The individual must be at the centre of the process and there should be equal access and fair treatment. Consideration must be given to the activities that are taking place and the impact of those activities upon the individual. And at all points in the process, information and guidance should be made available to the individual in order that they can make informed decisions about where they want to go and their future direction of their validation. Stakeholders, too, must be involved in the process. Formal providers, education providers, higher education, colleges, the voluntary sector organisations, adult education, and are key stakeholders in providing the opportunities to validate non-formal and informal learning. I'm sure it's the same in Canada as it is in Scotland, where our adult and our community provision they offer much in the way of learning in the community for adults, and this too can be recognised. Employers can also offer opportunities to have the learning that their employees have gained throughout their work life recognised through setting up systems to document and to record the knowledge, skills and learning of their employees. The EU guidelines helpfully set out a generic process which starts with the commitment of the organisation, setting out the company competency profiles, involve the candidate at all points in telling them what's in it for them, what benefit it has to them, 
completion of the portfolio, assessment, personal development plans and vocational training and validation of competencies. And I can relate this to our Scottish Police College who have set up their training and have had it credit rated on the framework for Scotland in order to benefit the, the police force from recruit right through to senior commander. Excuse me, I'm out full of ice. The systems that are put in place must be underpinned by quality assurance. In this way, trust can be developed that the systems that are there are reliable, that they're valid, and that they are using clear benchmarks and reference points, and that they are indeed fit for purpose. The, guidelines, the EU guidelines suggest three methods to test this um, quality assurance. And first is to evaluate practice, the orientation of the individual, how much information, how much guidance have they received, what information have they got and where they would want to go. Assessment, how do they assess, is the assessment fit for purpose and an external audit. And the external audit is to look externally at the two um, former processes, the orientation and the assessment. The processes, therefore, must be fair and transparent. And, of course, the development of the European Qualifications Framework helps with this um, transparency. It clearly helps to provide an understanding of an individual's lear uh, learning on the national framework. At what level that is on a national framework can be translated European-wide in terms of where would it sit when other frameworks using the European Qualifications Framework as that translation device. It goes without saying that the processes should be impartial and the professionalism of the practitioners is absolutely vital to this. They must have the skills which are up to date with developments in RPL and networking opportunities such as the CAPLA conference is an ideal opportunity to share the developments that's happening within the recognition of prior learning. We have to find ways of encouraging both learners and organisations to engage in the process of RPL for the benefit of the individual, and the individual should always be at the centre. The EU guidelines are important because they widen the scope of identifying learning, not just purely from the formal sense, but learning from wherever that learning takes place, at whatever level, in whatever country. There are, of course, challenges, and one of the challenges is one that Gail has mentioned already, and that is about language. If we look at how we, what we are calling today RPL or PLAR, it's the same thing but different terminology, which then ends up in some sort of confusion, I think. And the other thing is the cost, the costs involved. Who pays for this and how do you develop a sustainable model and a sustainable system? However, from the social aspect, the aim is to promote equality of opportunity and the EU guidelines support that, they support mobility and they support the disadvantaged uh, groups such as migrant workers and um, older workers. In terms of the Scottish perspective, I don't want to delve too deeply into the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework because I'm talking tomorrow about it. don't want to bore you too much on that. But you cannot understand where RPL sits in Scotland without understanding a little bit about our national lifelong learning framework. In Scotland, we have... All our national qualifications are on the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework. The framework has 12 levels. Sorry, I'll go back. The framework has 12 levels. The levels are based on learning outcomes. They must be quality assured, and credit is the measure of volume. One credit is approximately... It's 10 hours of learning. It's a notional 10 hours. It's a professional judgment. How long will it take the learner to achieve this learning outcome? 
and specific credit is the credit that, that can be transferred into particular programs. And this is indeed our framework. And you can see that we have the framework that from school qualifications over on the right hand side through the, the Scottish Qualifications Authority's framework for their, their qualifications, higher national certificates, higher national diplomas and others, professional development awards, national certificates, to the higher education framework, to the framework for the, the vocational education. Each of these qualifications has received a level, and you can see the level at the side, and all of them have received an allocated number of credits. Now you can see that level 7, there are several qualifications that sit at level 7. There is the advanced higher, the higher national certificate, and the certificate of higher education. Now these are not the same qualifications. They do not have the same purpose. They are not delivered in the same way. And the vocational education, of course, SVQ3 sits at that level too. But what they have in common is that they have been benchmarked against the level descriptors. And so therefore, they are at the same level of complexity, of difficulty. And it's a way of explaining to learners and to employers just exactly, um, the, A, the amount of work that they might have uh, in terms of the credit, uh, and also the level of the qualification that they were, are wanting to take. In Scotland, as Gail referred to, we have recently, there's something happened to the, the, the um, slides, we have recently set up a recognition of prior learning uh, network. And in order to, um, the, fir the first meeting that we had of that group, we had to think about the definition of RPL. Because within that group, within Scotland, people had different ideas about what RPL was. Was it purely the recognition of informal and non-formal learning? Or indeed was it the, the recognition of prior formal learning where somebody already had a, a, a formal certificates, either um, gained in university or college and wanted to use them to progress on to other learning? So our first meeting was given over to discussing what that definition would be, and we did include that the recognition of prior learning included both formal and non-formal learning in previous contexts. For the formal learning, for those learning provision that has been credit rated, the mainstream qualifications, as I say, have already been credit rated, all of them. That's how we design our education system. The, there are many non um, traditional qualifications and learning programs also credit rated um, and that credit can be used to transfer into other programs of learning. And that's taken care of in our guidelines under the uh, credit transfer guidelines and there are guidelines for that within our handbook. Sorry about that, a bit of a break. <laughs> So RPL in Scotland, when we, this was the definition that we came up with as a group, was RPL is a process for recognising learning that has its source and experience and or previous formal and non-formal and, uh, and informal contexts. And everybody was in the network was happy with that. The formal learning, as I said, is taken care of with the credit transfer guidelines. And many people who have already achieved a higher national diploma or a higher national uh, can, will, will use that credit to progress to degree and enter with advanced standing. So they already have 240 credit points if they have an HND and a degree is 360 credits. So the credit transfer for mainstream qualifications, but also for non-traditional and credit rated programs that may be delivered within the workplace or indeed within the voluntary sector. We've had a number of programs credit rated for young people, our youth link programs, our personal um, development programs that they have called ASDAN. Uh, and they've been credit rated and often these are delivered within the school, but also within youth centres and youth clubs. For the development of the 
SDQF guidelines for the recognition of prior learning. Like the EU, they had um, a, a national consultation. They consulted widely on what should be included in these guidelines for RPL. And the guidelines were eventually drawn up in 2005 by my colleague Ruth Whitaker. And they involve both um, being able to recognise learning for formative assessment, for career and personal development. And within the EU guidelines, that's called identifying learning, another terminology. And for, those, for the award of credit for formal qualifications, it's summative recognition. And that's for, uh, in the EU guidelines, is called validation. The key features of RPL is that learners need uh, to be supported. They need information and guidance in order to help them to know exactly where they're going, what the process is going to be, how will it be, um, what will it involve, how will it be assessed, how will it be facilitated, and how much will it cost. They need support to identify their learning, the learning that they have gained from their experiences, they need to be able to reflect on this and to present at their evidence, to select the evidence that they are going to present, that it's sufficient evidence and not too much evidence, but also uh, that it's sufficient to provide the necessary um, confirmation that they have learned. And they need to identify, if they wish, areas for further learning, and they may need support to do that. The key features of RPL is that it is benchmarked, the learning that's been identified is benchmarked to the, the level descriptors of the SCQF. So it has a clear reference point as uh, stated in the EU guidelines that the learning should have a clear reference point and that's exactly what we do. It can help to identify different pathways for individuals that they uh, might take in order to help them to get to where they want to go. There needs to be support for learners in the transition from the informal learning to the formal learning. And I was struck yesterday when I was listening to Guy who spoke of, of learners setting off on one path, but then through reflection deciding that that actually was the wrong path and that they need to, they, it wasn't actually where they wanted to go at all. Staff need to be able to understand that and they need to support the learner no matter where that learner wants to go and they need to support the learner in their decision. And staff in turn need to be supported by appropriate management systems. RPL processes need to be monitored. They need to be monitored and reviewed to look at the processes, how, how are they working, evaluating that, maybe taking account of how many people have actually undertook the RPL process within institutions, evaluating the learner's experience and evaluating the experience of staff. And it must be integrated within the overall quality assurance program of the, univer uh, the university college or whichever system is being used. Our College and higher education sector all have external um, review. The review of the colleges is undertaken by the higher, uh, the Her Majesty's Inspector of Education, and the review of the higher education sectors is undertaken by QAA Scotland, and they look at the processes uh, that, that RPL and that S the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework has been implemented. So, finally, really just to kind of sum up the, the SCQF part, the criteria for assessment we have is that it, the evidence that's presented must be acceptable, it must be sufficient, it must be authentic, and it must be current. And finally, when you look at the EQ, EU guidelines and the guidelines for SCQF in terms of the recognition of prior learning, we can see that there are several similarities we base our framework, we base our PL on our SCQF. EU recommends that it's based on reference points and clear um, enabled and, and links it to the European Qualifications Framework. It must have um, equality. In Scotland, we say it must be available to a wide range of learners. 
The information that's offered to learners must be clear, explicit, and it must have effective links to the QA systems and support for providers. The, the part that I might say we were maybe weakest on is perhaps the trained personnel, but it's something that we're looking at and coming to conferences like this can only be of benefit to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. And for those of you who um, are not familiar with national qualification frameworks and um, it, in Scotland or other countries and the European qualification framework, I think you would find it very valuable to just do a little bit of research on it because it has, for one thing, from our perspective, given RPL a home, a home and a way of referencing it to other kinds of learning. So one of the comments um, this morning from Maitland was that when we are looking at doing things in advocacy for RPL, etc., one of the things we need to do is base it on evidence. And very importantly, that as practitioners, we have that evidence base in order to be able to draw on and to make use of. So Christine is going to now give you a little bit of information about a new organization that is looking to develop more of that good research for us. Christine? Thanks, Gail. Uh, I passed out a little handout. I didn't expect anywhere near this many people, but uh, this is just some background information on my institution, Thompson Rivers University. And I'm going to, as Gail said, I'm going to be talking to you about PLERC. <laughs> Prior Learning International Research Center. One of the best, the miracles about this center was that we were able to get people from all around the world to agree on a name. <laughs> Gail's already talked a bit about all the different acronyms that are floating around out there, but PLERC, everybody liked, so. <laughs> um, now, I'm an old adult educator at heart, so I need to know a bit about my audience here. How many people are um, academic researchers? Okay, so we've got a few of those. Um, University-based, but practitioners in the university. I know, see Daryl back there. So there's a few. And the rest of you must be practitioners or policymakers or whatever. Okay, so I'll try to make it of interest to the whole range of, of people. Um, just a bit of background about uh, Thompson Rivers University OL. I, I'll, I'll refer to it as OL in this uh, presentation. We um, inherited the... Um, mantle the intellectual property and so on of the BC Open University which uh, for those of you who know about Plar history in Canada know that BC was very very active in the 80s and 90s in implementing Plar throughout the community college system. Uh, Wendy Watson and uh, Sue Brown at um, University of Fraser Valley are now reviving a, a Plar network in the province. Um, our university was formed uh, from the union of the BC Open University with the University College of the Caribou. And when it was formed, the university was given a very specific mandate to provide leadership in open learning methods. So we share that with open universities around the world. Uh, access, minimal admission requirements, continuous enrollments, um, delivery in, uh, through distance, various distance methods in a way that people can do independent study that fits with their time and uh, personal demands. So um, within that mandate, we have a very specific mandate for prior learning assessment and recognition to take a leadership role in that area. So why have PLERC, why have an international research center instead of a Canadian research center or a BC research center? Well, the answer is really the loneliness of the PLAR researcher. Right? <laughs> In any given country, there's only a very small number of PLAR scholars actively doing academic-based research. And the nature of academic research is that you need a critical mass of scholars to move the field forward, to move the discipline forward. Um, I'll just give you an example for those of you who are practitioners. How many of you have heard of the Kolb adult learning cycle? Okay, quite a few of you have heard of it. It's, it's commonly taught in, if you take a, a prior learning um, training course of some kind or an adult learning theory course, as the basis for PLAR. Well, there's a, an emerging consensus among academic researchers that the Kolb cycle is completely inadequate <laughs> for, as a theoretical foundation for explaining PLAR. Yet, to move that forward, to get it pushed out 
um, disseminated or explored amongst academic research and then transferred to practitioners is something that's not happening because there isn't that critical mass. Uh, we all heard this morning about uh, the passing of Alan Thomas, who was one of our academic PLAR pioneers, a great advocate for PLAR. I remember a few years ago, it was actually in this very room, when he told me that the only reason there was any PLAR work included in the wall uh, work and lifelong learning research that was being done at OISE under David Livingston was because he had pushed it. Well, he's gone, okay? Who's pushing it now? No one. And um, Joy Van Cleef, who's presenting in another room right now, uh, wanted, she's very well known internationally and internationally as an applied PLAR researcher, wanted to do a doctoral dissertation, couldn't find a supervisor in Toronto who knew enough about PLAR to take on her work. So consequently, she's working with a researcher in Paris. So we really felt that there was a need for an international um, network of PLAR scholars so that we could do all the things that PLAR scholars do, or scholars do for each other, peer review, joint ground applications, um, comparative international studies, and so on. And we're really hoping that PLRC will form that focal point. Now, we have our uh, PLRC public website, and so a lot of the information, I don't have a mouse. <laughs> I need to click on the live link. Do that. Do it here. Oh, there it is. Okay, while we're waiting, I'll just try and, um, try and tell you a bit about it. Um, basically, what we're trying to do with this internet, with PLRC, is to really st stimulate some in innovative research, to really um, create the opportunity for people to share ideas and, and uh, critique each other's work, have the discussions and debates that's really the essence of academic work. And the way we got started was that we had to, um, I was very fortunate that I was given funding by my institution to host an, an invitational meeting of international PLAR researchers uh, in Kamloops last July. And um, we will, uh, the people who attended came from around the world. We had, uh, it's hard for me to remember without the list, but I'll try and make sure I get everybody. I know there were nine of them. Okay. We had, from South Africa, we had Mignon Breyer, who's at University of Cape Town. She's been very involved in the implementation of um, RPL in post-apartheid South Africa and really does wonderful research, uh, just published some re um, wonderful stuff on teacher education and RPL. We had uh, Judy Harris, who's now uh, with Bishop Grosstest um, University College in the UK, and she uh, also did work in South Africa and uh, subsequently did a PhD at the Open University of the UK and co-edited one of the best theoretical books that's come out in recent years a book with uh, Per Anderson from Sweden, a book called Retheorizing Prior Learning Assessment. Um, really wonderful book. We had um, Ruth Whitaker from Scotland, who's Margaret's colleague and has been very, very involved. She's at Glasgow Caledonian University, has been very involved in the national qualifications frameworks and the links to RPL. Uh, then we had Nan Travers from Empire State College, which is a university in um, New York State. It's part of SUNY, and they've been very well known in the U.S. and around the world for their, they've been PLAR pioneers for a long, long time. So Nan herself is their director of prior learning assessment. They've also got scholars of that institution, um, Elena Michelson and Alan Mandel, who've done some wonderful books on PLAR. And Nan herself is working with uh, Barry Sheckley, working on the implications of neuroscience findings for um, PLAR research. Now I've lost count. Um, okay, we had Roz Cameron from um, Southern Cross University in, the United, in um, Australia. Roz's background is quite interesting because she actually works in a management faculty and her background is critical HR theory. So she really being, is, brings the business perspective. She's doing a lot of work uh, with their national training organizations around occupational development in RPL. Then we had, uh, from Canada, we had um, Angie Wong, who is a professor emeritus at uh, University of Saskatchewan, and she is uh, taking her work in an interesting direction, looking at service learning and um, its relationship to prior learning ex um, 
assessment because it, uh, universities, the PLAR agenda is kind of stalled. It hasn't gone forward very far, but the service learning agenda, which is basically based on the same principles of experiential learning, is really hot. So she's, she's working on linking the two of those. Uh, then we had um, Joy Van Cleef, who was present in her capacity as a graduate student because we're hoping that PLERC will stimulate graduate students, more students, to undertake um, thesis and dissertation research in the area of PLAR. And uh, through Joy, we were uh, fortunate to also have her supervisor, Dr. Patrick Workin, who's um, with the OECD. And he headed the gigantic OECD study of PLAR in the OECD countries and is working now on developing an econometric model for um, the impact of prior learning assessment on labor force development and so on. So it's a really stimulating group of people, really exciting group of people, and uh, the exciting outcome of it was that they all agreed to continue to serve as a board for PLERC, as our inaugural board. In terms of activities, we um, developed four uh, working group areas. The first is research, because obviously it's a research center. The second was networking, because we wanted to connect uh, researchers around the world together. The third is policy, because we want to make sure that the results of research impact policy, so that we can feed the, the findings from research into the policy-making stream. And the fourth was uh, dissemination, which is making sure that research findings get out to practitioners in a way that they can make use of them. Um, this, in part, was inspired some work done by uh, Dr. Saul Carliner at University, Concordia University, who did a study of how practitioners use research and discovered that they didn't. <laughs> So we were very aware that although we're stimulating academic researchers, we also have a responsibility and a need to make sure that that gets out into the hands of practitioners so they can base their practice on evidence. Evidence-based practice, for those of you who are in the health profession, is very important, equally important in PLAR. In terms of our um, activities, our planned activities, our first uh, big initiative is to create what could be called an international state of the field review based on the presentations that these scholars made at our inaugural meeting. Each scholar made a presentation either of um, his or her own research, and, and some people made two presentations. They also made presentations on PLAR research that they were aware of going on in their own country. So we are taking those presentations. They're posted on our website. You'll sure all have the web address if nothing else from this presentation. And uh, you can take a look at them, but they're all being written up into um, monograph form to be chapters in a book, and we are hoping that that will come out in 2010. It's being edited um, by Mignon Breyer and Judy Harris, and I will play a role in um, providing an integrative overview piece and uh, summary at the end. So that will, in all likelihood, be an e-publication, but it will be the first kind of international perspective academic perspective on PLAR that's been published since 2005 when um, Anderson and Harris did the last book on retheorizing PLAR. So that's a pretty exciting development. Uh, in other research initiatives are that we're, we're looking, we're trying to locate a really worthwhile international conference to have special sessions on PLAR. One of the dilemmas for PLAR researchers is they're not quite sure where they fit. When I was going through the background of people uh, who came to the meeting, you know, we've got economists, we've got human resource specialists, we've got educators. Where does PLAR fit? It's in some ways the same dilemma that's, that's uh, stalling the development of a national PLAR policy. It's fragmented. So we're trying to find one international conference where people can come and have um, an interdisciplinary dialogue on PLAR with other scholars in their area. So that's... Uh, probably going to happen in 2011 when we're looking at a conference that would ha oh, take place in Scotland as one possibility. There's also in Canada, there's a possibility of, of having a joint conference with um, work and learning uh, people through the Canadian Society for Studies in Higher Education. That would be in 2010. So that's pretty exciting and um, an opportunity for PLAR scholars to come together and have a peer-reviewed, <laughs> very important for an academic, peer-reviewed uh, presentation with other PLAR scholars. 
Uh, we're also looking at um, promoting or putting out a call for a special issue of an international journal, research journal, again for academics. Very important to get this kind of uh, publication on their CV. And one possibility for that is the, internet, uh, the Journal of Workplace Learning, which is a very well-known international journal, and it happens that one of my colleagues at TRU, Dr. John Bratton, is on the editorial board. So he's, he's quite willing to move that forward if we decide that that's, that's a place we should look uh, first for an, an op a publication opportunity for new research. Um, in terms of membership in PLRC, right now, um, we're in the process of going through our internal hoops in terms of what kind of organization this will be. We have the public access website. And again, you've all got the address, and you can read about PLRC there. What we hope to do with that is to post up uh, publicly interesting information, or at least interesting to researchers, on things like uh, where conference presentations have occurred on PLAR, um, any um, research publications that people have done, um, grants received, for example, Diane Conrad uh, at Athabasca University was recently uh, obtained a SHIRT grant, uh, which is a very prestigious grant in Canada. And uh, we, if she was willing, we could post that information up there that there was SHIRT, you know, what her research was going to be on. So different things like that. We'd also post, post links to what in the academic world we call the gray literature. There's lots of research that's done outside of academia that is relevant to, ac to academic research but it's not gone through the peer review process. Um, for example, even the OECD study, even though a very prestigious organization, uh, very big study, very competent researcher at the helm, would not be considered peer reviewed. And it's interesting to see, you know, when Patrick worked and presented his, his findings from that study, that for an academic researcher, it was like a huge batch of raw data that you could then take and um, theorize from. But it, in and of itself, it, it wasn't a particularly academic or scholarly piece. Great piece of data collection, but needed further work. So those are the kinds of things that we'll have on the publicly accessible website. We also have a, a Blackboard platform that we're using for the members of the board, and they are, um, uh, using it to, to communicate about the, the monograph, about the conferences, and so on. And as we expand our network, we will be using that for people who are actively engaged in PLAR research to uh, communicate scholar to scholar rather than a, a, a broader public uh, discussion. But we're open to all sorts of suggestions. It's very much early days. It's a work in progress, and we'll, we'll kind of feel our way. Uh, in terms of Expanding the membership, what we're hoping is that we'll have a network of networks so that PLRC can be a, a focal point and researchers in each country can hear about what PLRC is doing and what researchers in other countries are doing by, via PLRC. So Margaret mentioned that there's a Scottish uh, network developing. Roz Cameron is developing a network in Australia. And here in Canada, uh, last night we had a meeting of the Kapla University Liaison Group. So. That's the sort of dissemination method rather than having a lot of individual scholar members at, at, at this point. That's the model we're working on. But again, early days and any suggestions that people have for taking it a different direction, um, feel free to email me. I'm happy to, to talk about it with anybody. Great. Okay? Thank you. Great job with the site there. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. A great job without the uh, ability to go onto the site there. So, um, just in closing, because we don't have a huge amount of time for discussion here, I just wanted to go on to um, a couple of things in terms of iPlan as a whole and trying to connect some of these. One of the things we talked about are if we get to going to an international group, what might be some of the topics that might be of interest between various countries. These were some of the topics that came up as possibilities to start international discussion on. You'll see that a number of these have been brought up already in terms of 
things that are challenges in Canada as well as internationally. The last one I just want to note, common employment competencies. In Canada, we have essential skills and employability skills. In other countries, they call them different things, but those are often the transferable skills that people need to be mobile. What we're talking about doing now is trying to concentrate on one topic activity so that we can get started internationally and then go from there. So the other thing in terms of working up a working committee, both in Canada and internationally steering committee, what we can do in collaboration with the researchers, and then of course always could make it better if we could find some funding support to help grow it internationally. So I'm going to close down there with a thank you to our panelists. But okay, and to also note because a question had come in about who the key people on Christine's um, board, they're on her site. So those contacts. So okay, last minute because okay, okay, and then we'll have two questions, just so that we can get some comments or questions going here. I just wanted to uh, make sure that everyone was where we uh, at Open Learning are going to be offering an open learning scholar opportunity in the area of prior learning assessment and recognition. This is for, pre uh, for active academics to consider. Um, pretty generously funded, a two to four month opportunity, $5,000 a month Canadian. And if you want to hear more details, um, you can come to my session tomorrow or we'll be posting it up on the PLERC website in the next uh, week or so. Thank you. That was worth waiting. The, uh... <laughs> in Scotland, we had the development of the ScotCat framework, which was in higher education. The Scottish Qualifications Authority had their framework. And around about 1993, 4, there was the idea that it could be um, brought together in an integrated framework. So it's taken a number of years in the development. It's not something that's happened overnight. But in saying that, the, the funding that uh, is associated with that is actually very low. The Scottish um, Credit and Qualifications Framework Partnership is funded partly by Scottish Government. I said we had five partners, they're equal partners. The Scottish Government fund us to the extent of 570,000 a year for a national qualifications framework, so it's not a huge amount of money. There are small numbers in the partnership, um, in, the, in the company itself, it, there's only seven people, and I'm one of them. Um, and so we have um, a very small amount in 19, I'm trying to think back to, Ne about 94, I think, the, the, the government, the Scottish government gave the, the, an initial uh, funding of 60,000 to try and build the, the framework together. But it has to be said that at the heart of this is a willingness of the higher education sector, of our Scottish Qualifications Authority and the government of looking at what's the best for the learner. And at all stages in the de development of the national framework has been what benefit will this bring to Scotland and to the learners in Scotland. And that's, if you, if, when you read the history of it, all through the papers, it's what's the benefit to the learner. You'll hear more on that tomorrow at Margaret's session as well because they are looking at developing that kind of a business case um, for it. One other question before we... Okay. Yes, here. Um, perhaps my comments would be that people have skills that they don't know, skills that employers don't know, skills that can be brought out, that this is more like a, an idea of that PLAR exists as more than a listing of qualifications, a listing of how people qualify for things, and that in thinking about people, in my level of interest in terms of a research, it would be like, do you have psychologists, philosophers, or philosophical uh, research, um, sociological research about PLAR, which maybe don't fall into at all what you're doing, and that, that these levels of interest perhaps are more for things that Kale and Kaplar are doing in terms of practitioners talking about what they're doing. But for me, they also talk to a higher level of consideration of what PLAR is, not just details about how it's being done or, 
or standards that are being set, this kind of thing. I don't know if I'm being exactly yeah. clear on what I'm I, talking I, about. I think that's a, that's a valuable point, and, and we can give it to Christine in terms of the research, but did you want to make a comment, Christine? Yeah, just wait for the mic. Okay. Uh, yes, that's actually an excellent comment because that's exactly the type of work that we want to inspire with PLRC. Uh, the practitioner, the, the gray research tends to be very sort of nuts and bolts, counting how, how we did it, stories and so on. But uh, on, on our board, we actually have people from many different disciplines. For example, Judy Harris' background is sociology and we've got an HR person. My own background is educational psychology we have an economist. So there's a whole bunch of different um, higher level perspectives that can be brought to bear on PLAR. And quite honestly, I think it's absolutely essential to keep it moving forward. Otherwise, it just stagnates as a, a you know, and it's the practitioners may not be aware of how the research is informing their practice or how their practice is informing the research, but it's an essential relationship in my view. And so PLRC is actually quite different than what Kapla does because Kapla tends to focus in KL also on very nuts and bolts type work. Okay. This, is, this is for the more, the, as you say, higher level um, thinking that we're, we're starting at. Thanks. Thank you. I think we will close this down at this point again with a final thank you to our panelists. And just to note that if you are interested in getting more involved in the international network, there's a sign-up sheet by the registration desk and we will continue to put out information to Kaplan members in, in particular and others about the network as it moves forward. If you have ideas about specific things you can be involved in or you'd like to see happen, please do let us know. So thank you for your time today and those, these folks I'm sure would be happy with continued questions as you move through the conference. Thank you. Thank you.